After dinner speeches are supposed to be jokes strung together on a string of cliches, I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you because I'm going to be extremely serious. Very brief, but serious. And uh, what I want to begin by saying is that there has never been a better time to be an international lawyer. International law is at last emerging as a sophisticated legal system in an international society experiencing takeoff, to borrow two metaphors from development economics, emerging and takeoff. International law is living its own 1860s. From the 1860s in European countries and the United States, the forms of law multiplied prolifically to respond to the vastly greater complexity and energy of society. Legal fragmentation and institutional innovation as an expression of self-transforming social vitality. That's what's happening now to international law. So international lawyers are the most privileged of all lawyers. International law is the law of all laws. It's the law of the whole human world. And international lawyers are front and center in the drama of making this new international society. But there's something that greatly limits the part that we can play in that project. The international world suffers from a grotesque poverty of philosophy, to use a phrase of Karl Marx from 1847. Our predecessors at the national level had the great advantage that they could use 30 centuries of intense thought about the forms of law and order required for the good life lived in a good society. The grotesque poverty of philosophy at the international level means that the international world has one big idea and everything else is a deduction from that one big idea. And the one big idea is that the international world is not a social phenomenon, but an anomalous excrescence from national societies, an exogenous, unsocial, dependent reality, isolated from the vast intellectual superstructure required for the survival and prospering of national society. So reimagining the one big idea of the international world is an exciting challenge for those of us who think for a living. It's an exciting challenge for international lawyers, and it's a particularly delightful challenge for those of us who are philosophical idealists. Idealism, like relativity, takes two forms, general idealism and special idealism. General idealism recognizes that reality is made from ideas. The whole of science, the whole of society, the whole of law, all of them, are nothing but a fabrication of thinking, to echo a phrase of the Japanese idealist philosopher Nishida. And so what the mind has made, the mind can change. Special idealism recognizes that the mind contains a particular kind of idea, the ideal, a powerful form of mental energy that leads us to make a better reality caused by the magnetic attraction of ideas such as justice and the good and the true and the beautiful and the ideal. In George Bernard Shaw's play, The Doctor's Dilemma, the doctor had invented a cure for a life-threatening disease. And so how should he choose the people whose lives he would save? The idealist dilemma is also about curing disease and saving lives, but it is more complex. The idealist dilemma is three dilemmas. Should we simply give up and admit defeat? Who should we talk to? And should we tell the truth about the real state of the world? So first, should we idealists simply give up, go off and cultivate our gardens? It's certainly tempting. If you look at human history, the good done by good ideas has often been undone by bad ideas. The high civilizations of ancient Greece and Rome were compatible 
with incidental barbarism. The Emperor Constantine's legitimizing of Christianity led to the politicizing of a deeply unpolitical religion. The American social ideal of the city on a hill contains an idea of exceptionalism which has proved antisocial in relation to the rest of the world. Europe's idea of its cultural superiority fueled an imperialism in which others paid a high price to acquire its incidental benefits. Revolutions have been negated by reaction. The ideal of self-determination, that wretched idea of Woodrow Wilson's, opened the way for new tyrannies and corrupt oligarchies and failed states. The ideal of freedom has produced the extreme unfreedom of modern democratic, capitalist, technocratic society. We have to remember Stalin and Hitler when we think of the great world-changing ideas of Hobbes and Rousseau and Marx and Nietzsche. Then there is Emmerich de Vattel, the brilliant 18th century rationalizer of the one big international idea, proposing an international legal system appropriate for the newly emerging nation states. We've lived the Vattelian idea system for 200 turbulent years. And that's obviously what I'm about to challenge. So idealists know all about the ambiguity of social, socialized ideas, but we don't give up. Why? Idealists are realistic utopians. We know about the du duality of the human being, capable of self-harming and self-destroying, but capable also of self-surpassing and self-perfecting. So someone has to do the heavy thinking of human self-evolving and self-perfecting. That's why we do not give up. So the second dilemma, who should the idealist speak to? Ian Brownlee was a practicing lawyer and an academic. That interesting dimorphism in the biology of international law. Imagine that, practicing lawyer and an academic. He once said on a public occasion, semi-public occasion, Philip Allard is mad, but he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> and that's slightly more than half true. I won't say which half. Yes. Well, Brownlee's remark contains a Manichaean dualism. Practice good, theory bad. And... Uh, Thinkers have often been despised by those who regard themselves as practical people. Vattel was welcomed and admired, presumably because he was speaking theory to the very people, kings and politicians and diplomats, whose bizarre behavior <coughs> his theory rationalizes and justifies, and that's the international law you all practice. Marx and Gramsci were right to identify the cultural hegemony of the ruling class. Those who have most social power have most power over the formation of a society's ideas. What Marx and Gramsci underestimated was the propensity of the ruling class to disagree within itself. The ruling classes of earlier centuries were seething cauldrons of disagreement about everything. Quote, I am a human being and nothing human is alien to me. That wonderful saying from a Roman play <coughs> was the state of the mind of the old educated ruling classes, our predecessors in office. We are their successors. They knew that critical and creative thinking can change the world, can make a better world. So we idealists don't need to address any audience in particular. We must say, orbi et orbi, what we have to say and keep on saying it. Public thinkers <coughs> are megaphones of the mind. The future will hear us and the future will decide what to do with what we've said. So then there's the idealist's third dilemma. What should we say? Should we tell the truth? the whole truth about the world as it is. That's the most painful 
of the idealist's dilemmas. Even at this moment, it inhibits me from saying all that should be said. Quote, to tell the truth is revolutionary. That was the saying of Ferdinand Lassell, the founder of German socialism. Or another quotation, high over roaring temple bar, we must look at all things as they are. That's from a poem by Tennyson about the Cock Tavern in Fleet Street, not a hundred yards from here. High over roaring temple bar, we must look at all things as they are. Well, I hesitate to compare an international lawyer with Manichaean tendencies and Molière's bourgeois gentleman. But people who think that they are practical people speak theory in everything they say, whether they know it or not. The philosopher Julia Kristeva speaks of our life as a form of writing. To live is to write the story of our living. Each of us, each society is a work of fiction, a story with a huge backstory in human history and in our minds. Net nation and state and government are notorious fictions, metaphysical entities existing only in and for the human mind. The whole of the law is a vast work of fiction, a masterpiece of the human imagination, creating its own entirely artificial reality. It was Gordon Slynn in my first supervision in law in Cambridge, 50-something years ago, who made me realize that law is an artificial reality. Lawyers, even practicing lawyers, are creative writers, reinventing the story of the law every day. The presence in our lives of what Sartre called bad faith, lying to ourselves, bad faith, causes the anxiety, the angst of our everyday lives. Well, international lawyers should be especially troubled by angst. The international world is a world of ultimate bad faith, the world in which humanity lies to itself, about itself. And the big lie of the international world is the suppressing of an unbearable truth. Namely, we've inherited a world order that is a fundamental world disorder, causing one disaster after another and shaming the humanity of the human species. It's a world disorder of states, those random byproducts of the chaos of history, artificial amalgams of lands and tribes and governments, many of them criminal gangs, still playing the games of diplomacy and war that kings and tyrants have always played. War is savage insanity, as Erasmus said, and yet we rationalize war. And now a pandemic of violence is plaguing the world in religious and ethnic conflicts, causing horror and terror and squalor and misery and suffering to countless innocent human beings. It is the insanity of the species. And now there's a new global class system that suddenly appeared. A vast international Weberian bureaucracy are accountable to no one. An aristocracy of globalized wealth and ultimate economic power owing social allegiance to no national society. The masters of globalized science and technology beyond social and moral control, a disempowered and dispirited global middle class and a massive global underclass with no present expectation of a good life and a good society. That's the organization of the world we're in. Human beings are becoming alienated from their own humanity, dehumanized by superhuman collective systems and superhuman technology. And the trending sophist philosophy is whateverism. People say whatever things are as they are and always will be. The whole human feature, future depends on the well-being of the natural world. But we organize our cohabitation with our natural habitat by aggregating subordinate interests rather than by disaggregating the common interest of humanity. Disaggregating the common interest of society is the function of law. Disaggregating the common interest of humanity is the true function of international law. 
to quote Grotius, the advantage not of particular states, but of the great society of states. So how do we find the common interest? That's the function of politics. Politics is society's life force, an overwhelming and insatiable desire for social change. The expressing of a collective libido, to adopt another Christovianism. Uh, politicians channel the collective libido, I have to say, sometimes in more ways than one. It's called the aphrodisiac of power. So substituting politics for diplomacy is a major challenge in making the future of international society. Making bureaucratic internationalism politically accountable is a major challenge. Politics translates social values into judgments of the common interest, which may then be put into the universal form of law, which is then disaggregated and particularized and applied, modifying behavior, reconciling the common interest and private interest. That is the wonder and the magic of the law. The unfreedom of the law gives us the freedom to lead a better life in better societies, as Rousseau so brilliantly observed. That's the function of the law. At another time of revolutionary change, the great Tom Paine had a charming Manichaean moment. He said that society is a blessing and government is a necessary evil. Uh, constitutionalism means using social power to transcend governmental power, using legal power to transcend legal power. That's the great principle that we call the rule of law. Evolutionary constitutionalism under the rule of law has made possible the amazing transformation of national societies that continues to the present day. Lawyers from these ends of court were among the pioneers in the 17th century of the great principle of the rule of law. A conservative revolutionary wants to use the best of the past to make a better future. Installing the rule of law in a reimagined international society is a major challenge in making the human future. And to use the idea of society, Tom Paine's word, in rewriting the international story implants new philosophical genetic material. It creates the possibility of evolutionary constitutionalism at the global level, giving practical effect at last to what Suarez in 1612 called the moral and political unity of the human race. We must treat the diseases of the social mind at every level, sublimating humanity's wild energy in making a better human world, thinking Transcendental philosophy of human existence is a major challenge in making the human future. I call it cognitive therapy of the species. Well, Seamus Heaney said, whatever is given can always be reimagined. And I can tell you that reimagining the international story is hard work without public reward or honors. And it meets resistance, vested interest in what is, is the permanent enemy of what might be. Well, I'm going to end with a hosanna, maybe even a nunc dimittis. Remarkable things have happened during the 50 years that I've been actively involved in international law. There's the 1860s phenomenon, as I mentioned at the beginning. There's the great sophisticating of the study of international law over the last 25 years, and this conference demonstrates that. But my Hosanna is directed especially to the emergence of younger, intelligent, and committed international lawyers. It is a wonderful thing. Old international lawyers are beyond reason and beyond redemption. Young international lawyers can respect the social responsibility that goes beyond our professional responsibilities. Voltaire enjoyed making fun of what he misunderstood as the rationalism of Leibniz. But Candide can also be read as a diatribe of horrors caused by public power. In the famously ambiguous final pages, Dr. Pangloss does not admit defeat. The Turkish wise man had told him to stop worrying about the horrors of the world. But Pangloss persists, quote, I was hoping that I might reason with you a little about causes and effects, about the best of possible worlds, the origin of evil, the nature of the soul, and the pre-established 
harmony. That's the everyday fodder of us idealists. And Voltaire himself certainly didn't go off and cultivate his garden at Ferney. He went on arguing vehemently about everything until the day of his death. There's a delightful Ben Travato story that on his deathbed, the priest asked him to renounce Satan, and Voltaire said, this is not the time to be making enemies. <laughs> so non-engagement is also engagement, as they used to say in 1960s Paris. Uh, or as we might put it in English, whateverism butters no parsnips. Echoing Gramsci again, we need a new kind of fully engaged intellectual, able to balance pessimism of the intellect with an invincible optimism of the will, as Gramsci called it. So I'm more hopeful now than I've ever been that international law will have a better future, playing its proper part in the making of a radically better human world. And I can tell you, we will not give up. We will speak to anyone who will listen. We will tell the truth and we will change the world. Remember, this is one of my slogans, the only power over power is the power of ideas. So I'll see you all on the barricades, the barricades of the mind. Thank you.